Do you want to speak more to that? Because I didn't want to leave that incomplete when I, I saw that email from someone. Um, Yes, does somebody have a microphone for this lady here? Um, if, if you want to say something to that. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I, 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 I thought about what I was um, actually maybe not articulating was the, 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 the role of the ego in that situation was what I was asking. The role of the what? The ego in that situation. Okay. And not responding from how to respond from love in terms of and, and still remaining the difference between the ego and boundaries mm -hmm. and when how to know if your boundaries are from the ego or your boundary and judgment or if it's from like a loving protection from yourself. But I did take your advice when you said to speak to God about it. And I did, and it's funny because I thought, and it was funny that you said they're all child, children of God later, and I had just gotten a tattoo that said child of God, and so I kept that with me, and it's funny because it's changed my perspective as I walk down the street, and I feel much less controlled by those those things. Okay. And so I do, and it's crazy that you're bringing it up again, because I thought about it all week, and I felt ashamed of myself for asking that question, mm -hmm. and, and, and I was trying to come to terms with it, but I prayed on it, and I feel very, I feel much better about it. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. And I also want to thank the woman who wrote it. You know, it's interesting, because I do get quite a lot of, of, of mail, <clears throat> and I really appreciate the people who, who write in a way that does not make me feel judged or attacked, but just sharing something I might not have seen. There was something else that came the other day, so I always want to make it right if I was, uh, where is this lady right now? Um, yeah, I certainly want to make it right, so thank you. And uh, if anybody else wants to say, did you want to say something about that, ma'am? Okay. Hi, Marianne. I had actually written to you on Facebook about this a few months ago. Okay. And I don't know oh, if you I remember. When, it's funny because when she spoke, I'd assumed she was you. Wow. Well, <laughs> I just assumed because, oh, you had written me about that. So, because I do remember that. I did write to you about that, and you gave me such a beautiful response <clears throat> because I had said to you, you know, I'd been praying for them and it wasn't really working, and I still felt very violated in the way that it was happening. And I had been followed so many times. And it just felt unsafe. And then I also felt like they were intruding on my sexuality without my permission. Mm -hmm. And you suggested that I say a certain type of prayer in the morning, which I have been almost every day since then. And it's really working. And the prayer that I've been saying is, Holy Spirit, please wrap a cloak of invisibility around mm -hmm. me as I go out in the world today. Guide and protect me. And then also, Mother Mary, please protect me and to neutralize my sexuality except in situations that would serve. And I just want to tell you, as a follow-up, every time I've done that, which is almost every day since then, it's reduced from three times a day to maybe once a week. Exactly. And it doesn't feel threatening anymore, so thank you. And I had mentioned last week also about the cloak, of the, the invisibility cloak that's in Harry Potter. That's very powerful. Women can wear an invisibility cloak if you're married or married men or women, you wear an invisibility cloak. We are too self-indulgent with our chakras. You know, there's, there are certain chakras that your, that your love comes from. And keep, keep those high chakras, except for people in situations where it's responsible to keep those low chakras. Open them up. Open them up in the appropriate time. But if you go out into the day without prayer, it's like our energy is, is spewing out from too many places. And if you're all love, 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 but you're not responsible for that, and that's what prayer does. Prayer aligns you so that you are not only a more loving person, you're loving from the right chakras. Right? So that's great. So we're cool? So you're cool and you're cool and we're all cool with that? Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> but also, I want to say something to the men here. Just When I hear women, when women write to me or say things in situations like that, and sometimes I hear women... Uh, say, and then a man approached me and I didn't feel safe with that, I would certainly hope, 
um, that any man, and I assume it, but I just think it would be said that any man who sees anything like that would actually step in and, and say, hey, hey, you know, do your man thing. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, yes, uh, you, yes. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, after I ask this question and get your answer, I'm going to have to <clears throat> take a plane to China. So You're going to take a plane I'm to China? Take a, I thought you and, said I'm going to ask you to take a train. And, <laughs> and disappear. Um, <clears throat> only because this kind of fits in with the conversation. I'm not one of those guys on the street who calls, up, who calls after women. And I'm not one of those guys who, um, you know, if a woman were to reject anything like that, I would feel bad about that. But I am one of those guys who do look at women on the street. And, you know, to a certain extent, I thought, you know, that was just, you know, some kind of dalliance on my part. And it's only through this discussion that I, wasn't re that I didn't realize that there are, that there could be women who feel victimized by that. So, to that extent, you know, there have been times when I felt you know, that I have no control over that, that I'm powerless over that. And it's something that, um, you know, takes up, takes up valuable time and focus in my life. So the question now would be, what can I do? Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> a beautiful woman is one of the most exquisite creatures on the planet. She, women appreciate a, a man when he looks at her in a way that is not leery and leering and is not threatening and is just kind of you got it going on <laughs> trust me so and also when I talked before when I said to you last week don't worry it won't last um, there, and, and also the species would not it's like the guy did I tell the story about me and Deepak Chopra and the young guy? So Deepak Chopra and I are sitting on the stage and there's this young man and we're answering questions and this young man comes up and he says, my, my problem, he was like 22 years old or something like that, my problem is like every time I see a woman all I can think about is I want to have sex with her and I just can't get it out of my mind and all I want to do is, you know, I, I just see her and I think, oh my God, I'm like undressing her and blah, 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 and this is my problem, this is my problem, this is my problem. And Deepak says something along the line of, I don't know, sex addict meetings or something like that. And when I came to, when I spoke, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Nature has evolved over millions of years, making sure you feel that way at the age of 22. <laughs> I remember saying to Deepak, I remember it with quite fondness, don't you, Deepak? I mean, what are we talking about? This is nature. This is, nature has, there is the promulgation of the, the propagation of the species that we're talking about here. Where, where if, if men did not want that, and that's why younger women, I mean, this is all part of nature. Younger women have the higher breasts and the higher rear ends and the voluptuous skin in order to increase the probability that young men will want to have sex with them. It's so that the human race survives. Once a woman reaches menopause, nature could care less if I ever get laid again. So, <laughs> you're on your own after a certain point. Because nature's not invested in it. I mean, you've got to respect it. It's pretty amazing. When nature's not invested in it, because it's not going, then nature just doesn't need that. And same with men. When the sperm is less, I mean, you have to admire the brilliance of it all. We're, you know, every problem we have is because we're not reverent enough. But of course, we, we can appreciate that and still be civilized and cool people. But what I'm trying to say, and there was an element of that about it, let's all lighten up, especially on the streets of New York. Trust me, all these young women who, who, who spent two hours getting dressed in the morning wasn't so that nobody would look at her that day. Okay? She doesn't want to be threatened. She doesn't want to feel unsafe. But of course, but there is a way a man can, a man can look at women and, and appreciate it and it's all cool and there's nothing wrong with that. So I just wanted to say that. It's not like that's a bad thing that you look at women and enjoy them. I'm straight and I look at beautiful women and enjoy them. They're a beautiful thing. Okay, so basically I don't have to take that plane to China then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, cool, isn't that right? Okay, yes sir. <clears throat> 
Mary Ann, thank you so much for your book, um, A Return to Love. It was definitely an inspiring moment for me to return to love. Thank you. Um, I'm also very inspired by the work of Byron Katie. Um, I'm sorry, you what? I'm very inspired as well by the work of Byron Katie. Yes. And she, um, she speaks a lot to the fact that she does not pray. And um, that if she did have a prayer, it would be to be spared from the desire of love, approval, and praise. Mm -hmm. So um, recently, in this past month, <laughs> the universe has been telling me to pray. And mm -hmm. for the past few months, I feel like I've been purposely passive not to be asking for things because of closing the eyes and being in the silence. Mm -hmm. um, and I ask you here today, um, do I pray for love? Well, I think what Byron said is exactly right. To pray what she said, what you said she said, is exactly what we were talking about tonight. That was very brilliant what she said. She said, if I did pray, it would pray to be freed from the desire. As I said tonight, to be, the way to be happy is to want nothing. So you don't pray, dear God, send it to me. You say, dear God, take from me this feeling that I have that I need that to be whole. Because that's the difference between magic and miracles. Magic is where you use God as your errand boy to get you what you want. Miracles is where you just seek to be in service to all that is good, true, and beautiful. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Hi. I'm very worried about what's going on in the world with Brexit and all the immigrants and that kind of thing. I'm finding it hard to stay on a higher vibration okay. towards that kind of negativity. Okay. And a lot of times once I start meditating and I'm really in a really great place and I'm okay. on a higher plane, mm -hmm. I run into some racist nightmare and right. I feel like I'm being challenged. Is right. that what's happening? Right. Or? Okay, so this is where you want to be. Wow. The world is really falling like something. It's having, the world is having a nervous breakdown, which it is. The world is, every, the entire way we have set up human civilization at this point is crumbling because it needs to. It is completely unsustainable. It is insane. The way we run our economies is insane. The way we treat our earth is insane. The way we educate each other is insane. The way we treat each other is insane. So it's falling apart because it has to. You want to be at the place where you're like, oh, thank God I'm here. Thank God God sent me because I joined with all these other people. We're on it. I'm part of the revolution of love and we're going to handle it. That, so that's, that's it. It's like, yes, that is happening. The, the spiritual issue, you will not get over your fear by trying to run away from it. And you will not get rid of your fear by disengaging it. What it will do is you will deepen your meditation, deepen your spiritual work, your prayer work or whatever, praying that you might be of the, the light. Remember, we don't need, and we talked about this, don't be upset by this issue of the concept of the majority. You know, some people say, well, we think this way, but not, most people don't. Don't worry about it. The majority has never been what changed the world. The majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's free the slaves. The majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's give women the right to vote. The majority is never what changes a system. What changes a system is that critical mass of enough people. And that's how evolution operates. The mutation is never the majority of the members of the species, but the ones that move in the more adaptable direction. So what's going to change the world today is not a horizontal axis of change, but a vertical axis of change. It's not about enough people beginning to think differently, but those who do think differently going deeper and deeper with our own work, which in this case, ironically, is also praying for Donald Trump, praying for Hillary Clinton, praying for no matter whom. Whoever the people are that you fear, pray for them. Where there is fear, there cannot be love. I mean, excuse me, where there is love, there cannot be fear. Well, both are true. Does that make sense? So the point is, it's all going to be okay because God sent you. The Course in Miracles says God has a plan for the salvation of the world. Because that's really what you're talking about. How are we going to save this world? Well, we're going to save the world on the outside because enough of us are saved on the inside. And that plan, in Course in Miracles language, is the plan of the teachers of God. And the Course in Miracles says the teachers of God are whoever chooses to be one. 
They come from all religions and no religions. They are those who have heard the call. And the call, The Course in Miracles says, is going out in all units of time and space. All of us are hearing the call all the time. And it, in our own individual lives, this is the call. Lighten up, be kinder, be more forgiving, be less selfish, don't make this about you. Be elegant here, be savvy here, don't be a child here, be an adult, rise to the occasion. And then, so as we are called to the best version of ourselves, then we can be called because God cannot use us if we're not vessels that are prepared. And that's why we say every morning, use me, M dissolve that within me, which would make you less capable of doing your work through me. And there are enough of us, there are enough people on this planet. There are enough people, I feel this with all my heart, there are enough people in this country and there are enough people around the world who are going, this is insane and do not want it to be this way. Look at what's happening in every country of the world. You know, when I was in Israel not too long ago and we went to the West Bank, to the Palestinian territories, and the majority of people who are Palestinian and the majority of people who are Israeli, the, the, they, they, they don't hate each other. They fear each other at this point, but they don't hate each other. You know, the problem is always a small group, often in charge of governments and so forth, right? But we have enough people on the planet who are, who are answering to that, to that, to that call of, of another possibility. And that's why when I go to places like, like Israel and I see the people who are, who are working, there's a school in Israel called Hand in Hand. And the Hand in Hand schools, there are seven of them. And you know how you go into an elementary school and they have the letters, all the letters A, B, C, D, written in pretty little colored paper, right? Well, in the hand in hand schools, every classroom has one Arab uh, Israeli and one Jewish Israeli, right? One Muslim and one Jew. And all the children, they're both teachers and they have all the letters written in Arabic and all the letters written in Hebrew. And the children are learning each other's language and they're learning about each other's religion and they're learning each other's holidays. And so everywhere you go, you see people who are carving out the new possibilities. And all we have to do is keep our attention on the assignment we were given. The ego is very into me telling you what I think your assignment should be. And that's happening whenever I'm, I'm taking your inventory or reading what you're about. We have a full-time job. How can I be the person God would have me be in order to perform my assignment, which is my piece of this glorious revolution which is happening? You know, you see such genius, and that's the poignancy of this time too, that at the same time we see all these horrible things happening, you also see these amazing things happening. And in every field of endeavor, you see the geniuses and you see people who are positing alternatives and different ways to be and creativity and nature continues and people continue to have babies and babies are born and people fall in love and people forgive. We just have to, at this point, be very, very intentional. There is no time to waste. You know, one of the things about aging is that you don't have five year, you don't have a lot of five year detours anymore. You know, you, you don't want to waste five years here or 10 years there. Like when I woke up one day in LA, it's like, I think I'm gonna to move to New York. I didn't think about it for five years. I don't have another five years, you know what I'm saying? Like just if you feel it, do it. And that's the way it is on the planet right now. And all the mistakes we have made in our lives, all of your failures as well as your successes. And the only real failure is a failure to learn from something that we went through. So our failures, our so-called failures, and the Course in Miracles says some of your greatest successes you thought were failures, and some of your greatest failures you thought were success. If you learn from it, and it can make you wiser now, and more humble now, and more grateful now, and more loving now, it was a success because of what you did with the experience. And this is the time. What I see as I travel around the world, and in my career, which gives me the privilege of a real vantage point because I meet so many people in rooms like this, we, there are enough of us in place. Most of us, from, what, from my read on other people and on myself, is not that we're not in placement, we just need to step it up. That, that most people I know, it's a matter of practicing what we preach. I always say, you know, my life works really well when I practice what I preach. The, the era of data collection is over. 
Most of us are still in rehearsal, many of us are still in rehearsal mode when we know it's time for a performance. Does that make sense? And so that's it. So when you see all this happening, how could it not be happening? There is a limit beyond which the Son of God cannot miscreate, the Course in Miracles says. Human civilization is predicated on principles that are so contrary to who we are in our hearts that this thing has to fall apart. And so people are acting out of the craziness. So our job, those of us who choose, is to be those who help to tenderly lay the old way down and to give birth to the new, midwives of the new, in whatever your talent is, whatever your ability is, that you pray that you, that you be part of the upliftment of the consciousness, the holy, the nation of priests. Does that make sense to you? As long as you're thinking, how can I help? Yes, ma'am, over there, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> One of your first talks here in New York, um, you specifically talked about uh, politics. Politics? Just in a general way. <clears throat> and the, the gist was, I don't want to name names, but I will, um, that if there's a Donald Trump or if there's someone out there who's bigoted, we all created that, if not by being bigoted, by, by not being the opposite of that. And... Um, I'm a professional singer and I did a gig not too long after that talk and I was talking to some people before and they were bitching about, you know, politics and stuff and I said, well, you know, we can be the opposite of that and we can be more loving and we can, that's exactly what we can do. And so I do this gig with these fabulous musicians and the gist after a gig like that is everybody comes up and says, you were fabulous and you were fabulous. And this guy came up to me, and, and he had been thinking about that the entire gig, and he said, you know, you're right. Um, we are responsible for that, and we can't, and I, and I thought that was, a that was a beautiful gift I got from you. you. You helped me have the permission to think that, and then by spreading it and talking about it, this guy felt like, instead of, bitching about it, he felt like, oh, now I've got permission to actually think that I can be the opposite of this. And it was, it was really an amazing thing. It was very cool. And the Course in Miracles says that we are all teachers and we are all students. You know, from a Course in Miracles perspective, to teach is to demonstrate. And so I'm giving lectures on a Course in Miracles. That doesn't make me a teacher of God. You know, somebody was saying to me the other day who was in my field, well, since I've stepped out as a teacher, I said, you're so precious with that word. You know, get over yourself, I'm a teacher. No, 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 that doesn't, no. We're all teachers and we're all students. And in our relationships with people, it's really beautiful how you, how you see that with your friends. One person is half a step ahead in one area, the other person is half a step ahead in the other area, and we share with each other because we had different childhoods and different places where we've been hurt or strengthened, and that's the beauty of it all. So you were, we, it's all passed along. And, and the Course, and that also relates to what you said, ma'am, because the Course in Miracles would have us know, if you are available to be used, you have more opportunities during the day to demonstrate the alternative than you think. You know, we all know that. I mean, think of the situations in, in, in life where you just, by being more positive in a situation, more loving, other people are looking at you and, and gaining from that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if one person affects a million people, that's yes. a million and one that are affected. Yes. If a million people all affect one person, that's two million people. You, you know what I mean? So if we affect one person, mm -hmm. that creates a larger group than one person having outcome on one. So if you want to do something, affect one person or two people. And if the more people that do that, that spreads exponentially. Well, you know, the Course in Miracles just says, in any given moment, just be available. That you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know what effect. Have you ever had situations, I know I have, where... Let's say I'm uh, really trying to figure something out. 
and I haven't been able to. And I've talked to all my friends, I've talked to therapists, I've done whatever, I keep experts, I haven't figured it out. And then it's saying, I'm having my hair washed. And some girl's just talking on and on and on, and she's just talking about something, and she happens to say something, and I'm like, that was what I needed to hear. She would have no idea, but the universe knows that that's what I needed to hear. So, and that goes with what we were talking about earlier tonight. We're not, a, when we're in that grasp mode, trying to make it happen mode, on the make mode, we're missing what's coming at us. You know, it's like people who talk too much, they don't receive. They're, they're giving out so much they don't receive. So, because we have this attitude about life, always making it happen, sometimes we're missing out on the, the miracles that are being delivered to our door all the time. I was the other day, my daughter gave me these pair of bedroom slippers that are real soft and real wonderful. And I lost them or I packed them somewhere wrong or something like that. They weren't expensive slippers or anything, but they were real soft and foamy and I loved them. So the other day I was in Miami and I was staying with this girlfriend of mine, this real close friend, and I walked into the, my bedroom and there were these really foamy bedroom slippers. I said, are these for me? She said, yeah, I was at a drugstore the other day. I thought you might want those. I mean, who does that? Who, have you ever bought foamy bedroom slippers for your friends? But listen to this, this is even better. Because I thought, see, she just followed the impulse. And then this was even better. She said, yeah, I was also going to buy you one of those things like for when you're washing your face and put, anyway, it's this thing you wash your face on. And actually, I needed that too. But she didn't, she didn't, she didn't follow that one. But I thought it was interesting, she even got that. She thought, then I thought, why would I be buying you these things? And that, right? So that's the, that's the way the universe actually operates, is every need is filled, but we're not available enough. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is about the holy relationship. Holy relationship. And where that is in terms of like this world, if, if, if we want a holy relationship, is that wanting something of this world? And okay. also, can you have a holy relationship with somebody who doesn't know what that is? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, what was the last thing you said? I didn't hear the end of her sentence. Um, if you can have a holy relationship with someone who doesn't know what that is. Oh, yeah. Usually it's better for some weird way. Weird <laughs> You get over real quickly, if somebody reads A Course in Miracles, he'd be perfect. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about that. Um, the notion of the holy relationship in The Course in Miracles, and I talk about this in the relationship section here. In fact, um, I was going to actually read this, but maybe I'll just talk about it instead. <clears throat> but I do talk about that in here if that's of interest. So we were talking earlier tonight about how everything in this world is holy or unholy depending on the purpose ascribed to it by the mind. Now the Course in Miracles says it is as though the mind has been split in two. The mind that is your holy mind, your whole mind, is the spirit within you. You have been cast into the outer kingdom of non-holy thinking while living in this world, <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit is one name for the bridge that God has created by which we can dwell within the unholy realms and be reminded of the holy even while here. You with me? That is your spirit. The other aspect of mind the name for it used in A Course in Miracles, although it's just, you know, there's different jargon and different teachings, is ego. The word ego in The Course in Miracles <clears throat> is the way it is used, the term is used among the ancient Greeks. It is the idea of the small separated self. And we talked earlier tonight when I think it's me, just about me, it's about me, that's ego. If it's about me, even if it's about what is my purpose, it's still about me, that's the separated self, the isolated self, there is not my wisdom. Okay. Now, when I think that I am separate from the rest of the universe, remember, because I think I'm just my body, the Course says you're like a wave in the ocean thinking you're separate from other waves. 
And so if I think I'm just one wave separate from the other waves, how could I not feel terrified of the ocean? Right? I'm afraid that the other waves are going to obliterate me in any moment. But if I think of myself as one with all the other waves, then I identify with the power of the ocean and I feel at home in the ocean and unafraid of the ocean. Okay. Now the ego mind says, you are separate from the rest of the universe, which means I'm separate from God and I'm separate from people. So I am cast into this outer mental kingdom where I'm in a, a, having an experience of deep hysteria existentially, right? Makes sense with me so far. So the ego mind, which is the mind that thinks every thought that will maintain my suffering, that's what hell is, that is what sends you to hell. God doesn't send you to hell in punishment for those ego thoughts. The ego sends you to hell, being tension, anxiety, etc. So remember when I said earlier that, okay, you want things and the ego says, if this isn't making you happy, obviously it's just you don't have enough things. So the ego mind, the same mind which makes you feel separate from the rest of the universe when you go, but I feel so lonely here. Now, the, the, the answer to the loneliness, the real antidote, is to realize you're one with the universe. What is there to be lonely? You are one with the universe. But the ego says, I'm so sorry you're so lonely. You know, there's one special person out there. If you only met them, like no pressure on that poor person, right? If you only met them, then you would not feel lonely. Now, this is a really interesting trick of the ego. I remember Helen Reddy, many years ago, there was a singer named Helen Reddy, and she used to sing a song that went like this, you and me against the world. <laughs> and I, this was before I did The Course in Miracles, and I remember thinking, I don't care who you are, I'm switching sides. That is not good odds. You and me against the world. And that's supposed to be like a really romantic image. <laughs> you and me against the world. <laughs> right? Now, so the ego says, if I only find one person. Now, let's talk about that psychologically. My entire well-being rests on your behavior. <laughs> is that going to be healthy for us? Is that going to help me? <laughs> How is that going to make you feel after a while? Hot for a week or so. After that, I need you to do it this way. I need you to be that way. I need you to talk to me a certain way. I need you to behave, etc. That's why the ego's dictate is seek but do not find. Now, remember what we're talking about here. Everything is used as a purpose. That's the ego's purpose of a relationship, to keep me in hell. Now, it says in the case of the special relationship, no, I'm looking for love. But once you get there, you're actually doing the things because you think you need this person, you are actually, more often than not, led to behavior that will actually repel rather than attract and maintain the love. Okay. The Course in Miracles says that in the hands of the Holy Spirit, your relationships are holy. Now, and I am going to read you now because I wrote this out. <clears throat> relationships, this is from my book, but this is what this is about. Relationships are where we come to heal. Not because we're always able to be our best within them, but precisely because we're not. They do not just highlight our strengths, they put a magnifying glass on our weaknesses. And that, in a way, is their purpose. They do not just expose our rough edges. They give us the chance to smooth those edges out. Healing is a kind of detox process in which everything that needs to leave our systems must first come up and then out. That which lies unhealed within us comes up for review, that we might consciously see where we're wounded in love and surrender the wound to God. Now, I go on to explain this, but I'm, I think I can explain it better with that without reading it. Oh, sorry. So, have you noticed you fall in love with somebody, right? And it's all fantastic for a few weeks, maybe. <laughs> a few months, right? Never a few, but okay. And then, what traditional psychotherapeutic wisdom holds is that when you first fell in love, you see it was all mutual projection. And then reality set in. The metaphysical past says the opposite. When you fell in love, you were having a mutual enlightenment experience. It wasn't that then reality set in. Then the illusions of the world set in. And that is because in everything, this is not a line from the Course, but it's out there and it's a very good, you've heard this one probably, love brings up everything unlike itself. 
Have you noticed you never blow it like you blow it around the people you love the most? So this person that you want to have this perfect relationship with is the person that, number one, you will judge the most because you have the special relationship thing going on. It's just because I love you that I want you to act that way. If you acted that way, we could have a better relationship. See how sly the ego is? So I start judging you. I don't judge my friends for that. I don't say about my friends, you should call at a certain point or call me a certain amount of time, but you start doing that to that person. And then the ego mind has this idea of how you should be. And so because my ego mind has an idea of how you should be, I judge you harshly if you're not that way. And if you're not that way, my ego says, I need to leave. Meanwhile, in your presence, it's going to bring up my unhealed places, just like this relationship brought up your unhealed places, because relationships are hospitals for the soul. The universe is intention, intentional. And the intentionality is that we all become enlightened creatures. We all become self-actualized. Relationships is where all our stuff will come up because that's where we will be healed. In the hands of the ego, it will be my reason to reject you. And I will have plenty of friends who will say, well, absolutely, you just shouldn't take that shit. <laughs> right? And, you know, that bounce. <laughs> right? Right? In the hands of the spirit, the holy relationship, where's that woman? The holy relationship is where it's understood. This is why we were brought together. We can do it with each other or we could do it with the next person. Your stuff's gonna come up because this is where you're unhealed and my stuff's gonna come up where I unhe I'm unhealed. So I get a little needy and controlling and you get a little aloof and arrogant and selfish. Now, I can, depending on the, on the context of two people's consciousness. Now, the two I just mentioned is one, one form it takes, but there are a lot of different ways that your stuff rubs up against mine. Just like when you have, when a gemologist has rough emeralds, rough amethysts, how do they smooth them out? Either manually or technologically rubbing them up against each other. My rough edges are going to rub up against your rough edges. That's how we're both going to stay smooth, get smooth. If, in fact, I own it, I am willing to listen to you when you say what you don't like. I am willing to seek to do better, be a better version of myself, and if you're willing to practice mercy and compassion. That's what a holy relationship is. So a holy relationship is where there's still going to be a bunch of rock and roll going on, you know, like your stuff and my stuff coming up. A holy relationship isn't where, you know, Mr. Perfect meets Miss Perfect or Mr. Perfect meets Mr. Perfect or Miss Perfect meets Miss Perfect. As I always say, if there's an enlightened master out there, would they be wanting to date you? I mean, you, you think that's, they're looking for you in your state? No. Somebody who's looking for you, the Course in Miracles says relationships are assignments. And we are assigned to people with whom there is maximal growth opportunity. So, when you say wanting a holy relationship, every relationship is either holy or special, depending on whether it's in the hands of the ego or hands of the, of the Holy Spirit. In the hands of the ego, a special relationship, wanting you to be special, I want you to act a certain way. And so, I will try to control you and so forth. A holy relationship is I will seek to be trying to take responsibility for my part and my being as loving and my being non-judgmental. That doesn't mean you don't have boundaries with people. Let's say in, whether it's a husband, a wife, and a boyfriend, a girlfriend, an employee, whatever, you have boundaries, etc. But as the Course in Miracles says, it is your job to tell your brother he is right even when he is wrong. That doesn't mean tell him he didn't do something foolish if he did but it means that we can still affirm the innocence in someone else. That's what a holy relationship is. Now, when you said, is it wrong to want a relationship, to want a romance or whatever, the issue is this. In the hands of the ego, a romantic relationship are two emotional invalids joined at the hip. And we've, m most of us, I know I have been, many of us have been in relationships where in looking back, we can see we use the relationship to hide both of us were hiding, right? I, you know, we were hiding rather than healing our stuff. But in a holy relationship, I'm not thinking that you complete me. I don't think that your, your behavior is going to complete me. I am complete in God. And that is a completely different psychological construct. Much easier said than done, by the way. You know, this is the area of the egos. This is where the greatest spiritual contest happens. Does that make sense? So you have to have a conversation with 
No, it's interesting that you say that, going back to that issue. The Course in Miracles actually says, when you place a relationship in the hands of God, and I love how th this is the line, whoever is saner at the time. Because sometimes jargon gets in the way. I remember once being at a therapist's office and the therapist said, can you say everything that you just said without using Course in Miracles language? <laughs> and that was important. Because jargon, the, the ego will use the jargon too. Do you know what I'm saying? So sometimes the people who have the most to teach us are, are, don't share the spiritual path one at all. That can just be used. Do you know what I'm saying? All right. All right, now we don't have much time, so I have to go very, very quickly. I'll do those three, but just very, very quickly get your question. I'm going to very quickly get to my answer, and I can do it. I know I can. Okay. Uh, very quickly, this gentleman, that lady, and that lady, and then we've, I've got to let you guys go. So, hi, Marianne. I'd like to pick up right where you just left off with regard to the jargon about the Course in Miracles, I'm right? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't hear you. That's okay. Okay. Try again. I'd like to pick up right where you left off about the jargon. Yes. About the Course in Miracles. Yes. So, if you're doing the work, yes. you're doing the course, and two of you are doing the course, and sometimes the course, the information in the course is not interpreted the same. Okay. What do you do with that? Well, first of all, in, in issues of relationship, I'm either judging you or I'm not. I'm well, either are attacking you. Always judging? you or Pardon? Are we always judging, some way, shape, or form, even if when we're forgiving? That's what, that's what I just got stuck on, by I'm the way. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Are we always judging, even when we're, when we're forgiving? No. Okay, then I need to learn more about that. No, well, I don't have, first of all, in terms of what you were saying about two jargon, I, this is what I once, many years ago, this is what <laughs> happened in my house. I don't care what Marianne Williamson said. Huh. <laughs> I was talking. <laughs> care what that book said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we all have those moments where I don't care what it says. Right, okay. If, if you were judging me, um, I feel it. If I am judging you, you feel it. Now, I've been in relationships where I remember somebody said to me once, where I, he, he had a complaint, and I said, what did I say? What did I do? And he said, I can just feel it. He was right. It was still in my mind. It was just leaning on him. It should be different. And in love relationships, it's very, very hard. Because you have this thing, you need this relationship to be a certain way. Your ego says this relationship is your salvation. And when you're in it, it's so cr you don't even realize it sometimes until afterwards that you had an agenda for another person. And that's what the ego has. The ego has an agenda for another person, how you should act in this relationship. Now, if I give this up and you act a certain way, I may or may not choose to remain there, nor should I. It just might be that if I'm not judging you and I'm not trying to control you and I don't have an agenda for you, that you will behave in a way that does cross appropriate boundaries and I should not be there. That was called important information, right? And if, if it is a relationship that I should be in, you care what I think, what I feel about certain things. And if I have to try to manipulate you or control you or have an agenda for you in order to get you to do those things, then that's not going to work anyway. You know, I always say, and, and it was in my first book, and I think it kind of got out there a lot, people say, if the, the train doesn't stop at your station, it's not your train. And if it's not your train, and you're working so hard, like you know how we become in England, they call it leg limpets, you know, you're trying to hold on to his ankle, you know, so he won't leave the room. You're actually keeping the train that is your train from getting into the station even if that next train is that person. So from A Course in Miracles perspective, and our experience proves this, you know, th there's a line in the Course, one of the lessons is, there is no love but God's. The ego says there's the love between friends, there's a love between parent and child, there's love, that romantic love is somehow different. And I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble with this one. The ego mind is so
so sly on the issue of the special relationship, where we will find ourselves saying something like, excuse me, this is not about forgiveness. This is not about judgment, okay, or whatever, when it, absolutely it is. And sometimes I'm afraid to just forgive you or just judge you because I'm afraid that if I, or not judge you, because I'm afraid if I do that, you will walk all over me. That's important information. Does that make sense? A lot of times when I've worked with couples, I'll, I'll find myself, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say to someone, you know, I really believe in all that Pat Allen stuff. I think she's brilliant. She says that a man's greatest psychic need is that his thoughts be respected, and a woman's greatest psychic need is that her feelings be cherished. And so much comes from that that we don't have time to go into tonight, but we do some time. And sometimes it's just the way we talk to each other. I see couples sometimes, and I know I've done it myself, we talk sometimes to the person we love the most in ways that we would never talk, we would never be that unkind to a friend. Right? And just to, to, and to say to a man in a way that is more respectful of his thoughts, to say to a woman in a way that is more cherishing of her feelings. So sometimes I'll find myself in counseling just saying, could you make that same point but relanguage it in a way that is more respectful? You can you, you know, like it's basic nonviolent communication that you don't say, you made me feel. You say, when that happened, I felt. And I see so many couples, and I know in my own relationships I've experienced this, but some of these basics you learn, and they're so obvious when you hear other people, where he was just so, they're so mean the way they talk to each other, and they love each other so much. But we, we've lost a sense of, and I think this is sort of generational too. I don't think my parents' generation, I think they were, someone that you love deeply is someone you should be kinder to, have more manners with, not less. But in the process of all that, so we yes. introduced forgiveness, right? Yes. And we talked to, just started to touch on that. At some point, when forgiveness doesn't really like it, it doesn't feel like it cuts it anymore. Like, okay, I forgive and I forgive and I forgive. Are you married to this person? Um, yes, no, yes, no. It does matter. It, well, yes. Okay. And, and there's, but the no, thing is... No, it matters. It's a different question. Well, no, and I'll tell you why, because I seem, I seem to be seeing a pattern with um, one that I was married with and one that I am now with. Um, Does she, is she buy into all this as well? Is yeah, she we're doing the course together, okay. sure. Well, if, if you would like to talk to me sometime, if that would be of value to do, just that let me know. That would be a blessed thing be because I feel like this, the course is actually working me to the point where I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Okay. Which I guess could be a good thing. Okay. Talk to me after and we'll, we'll do that if you like. Thank you. Okay. okay, I said I was going to be quick and I wasn't. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Because we, we're late. But yes, ma'am. Real quick. <clears throat> Hi, Marianne. I'll Hi. try to be quick. Okay, so I was in this relationship last summer, and I was trying to use him to fill a void. Yep. And I was really grasping. And then I came across your Aphrodite Training? seminar, yeah. and I did that, and it was quite delicious, I must say. Thank you. That's the online course, the yeah, Aphrodite Yeah, it was really thing. good. You, ladies, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, I went to, you recommended that we do... Catherine Woodard Thomas, uh -huh. 49 Days to Love. Uh -huh. And I did that, but I did it very um, half-assed. Like, uh -huh. oh, you know, do the assignments. And I still actually, am, I have one assignment to do, but I'm taking like three weeks to do it, uh -huh. right? But I went from grasping in my last relationship mm -hmm. to feeling so fulfilled right now right. and really loving myself and just right. enjoying and not caring if I don't have a right. date on Friday night in the summertime anymore right. Right. and just really digging me, right? right. But <laughs> my ego is like, you're going to end up like that lady with your two cats who hasn't had sex <laughs> for 10 years and that's just like this nightmare chasing me okay I, I have one i have two things to say the first one is some of those women alone with two cats are happier than other women who have been married for 30 years <laughs> but the whole not having sex for 10 years thing is like yeah you can tell me what's going on with some of those women with those two cats but but there this is something else that i learned from pat allen and her whole thing on this is brilliant <clears throat> 
A man, the psyche of a man, the brain of a man, and so forth. A man is hormonally programmed to not want to give something to a woman if she is demanding it. That is the healthy masculine. And our neediness is, is experienced by a man as a demand, which it is. So it's one of those things. If, if that's what you're thinking, and our behavior reads, I need you to be this way, it will repel. I remember um, somebody, I read somewhere or something about somebody who asked an older couple who had been married for decades, uh, what, uh, what was the secret or something? And the man said, we expected less. One of the things, I, I noticed one day I walked into my parents' bedroom. And my mother had a, a romance novel next to her bed. And my father had German philosophers next to his bed. <laughs> and I realized, next to his side, and I realized that I had been a woman who, if I was reading a book and I thought a man's, when I was younger, if his book, like, I would say something like, why are you reading that? I would just never do that. And so if I don't, and so in other words, I don't need him to read what I would read, right? And I used to, and so I used to have so many ways he needs to be a certain way. So if you have that thought, or I might end up lonely, that's not going to help that, right? So like sometimes one woman said to me, um, when do you know when to let a, let a man go? Well, what my experience has taught me, every morning. Does that make sense? And by the way, you know, the core, <laughs> it's the only chance he's coming back. Okay, so hold on a second. <laughs> because it's true, because this, so as far as the future is concerned, there's also something about the future. The Course of Miracles says the only place where God's time or eternity meets linear time is in the present. And there are two lessons in the Course about time to mention there. One is I place the future, no, um, the past is over, it can touch me not, because it's only in your mind. And the other one is the future. It's only in your mind. And one of the lessons is I place the future in the hands of God. So that whole thing about the woman and the cats and I'll be alone is simply, it's like when we did the meditation tonight, and I said, we still hear that voice, but we give it less credence. And as you grow, you will hear that voice and you will know that that's just your ego who wants you to see that image so that you'll get graspy so that you will ruin this relationship. Because the ego's dictate is seek but do not find. So that image that the ego is giving you is to me, it's because you really want relationship. It's the part of your mind that is intent on sabotaging the relationship. That image will not attract love, attract and maintain love. That's the kind of image that will make, lead you to sabotage love because it will make you needy and desperate. See, I rehearse these things for your sake. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, ma'am, very quickly. Does that make sense, ma'am? It does. Yeah, thank you. Thank, yes. you. thank you for taking the question. First of all, we share a very dear friend, Ryan Weiss. Oh, that's cool. Who speaks to you so fondly all the time. Me too. Um, so I... He sure does know a lot of people. Every day, he's my also know where I am. I know. Ryan, he's a knish, if you ever meet this guy. <clears throat> so, um, I don't exactly know how to ask this question, but it's a place I get stuck. And that is, I feel like a yes to being a vessel. I want to be of service, I have a counseling practice. I want to be of service in as big a way as I possibly can be. I have some form of attachment to that. It feels like in this culture, um, in order to do so, I have to separate myself from the whole and be, a brand, be about my own personal brand and my social media and my Instagram. And it's, I, don't, I don't know how to do that, that isn't what appeals to me about the process, but I don't know how to be, uh, relevant isn't the word, um, have access to uh, being part of greater good right. without um, separating myself and being me, me, me. You know, your question is a, is a very good one. It's particularly applicable to younger people because this has all happened over the last few years 
with all this business of, of social media and so forth. It's like my friend who was saying, since I stepped out as a teacher, I said, don't be so precious about, you're a teacher, you're a teacher, I'm a teacher, she's a teacher, we're all teachers, just make it less, you know, and he was, and there was this whole article about people who are younger, do you have enough Facebook following? My, I don't have as many Facebook followers as you have, and you really have to make a decision in your life not to, and that's why we're here. That's why you come here, you know, whether it's my lectures or anybody doing anything like this. You come here to be in a room where there's somebody having a different conversation. And it seems like common sense when we're here, but then you're going to go back out into the world tomorrow and face all that. And that's why you build the musculature. It is, it's about you, you build musculature, physical muscles, and you build attitudinal muscles. It's all, you know, it's like Jesus saying, Satan, get thee behind me. It's like you hear it. It's like when I heard that sentence about the bestseller, and then I did, thank you, darling. Then I laughed at myself. You, you hear it. You see the image of the, lady, the old lady with cats, and you say, I get that that's just the self-sabotaging part of me. And so you, you do have to have discipline. The word discipline and the word disciple come from the same root. The peony does not have to compete with the rose. I said to my friend the other day, who was, I stepped out as a teacher and some, and, you know, when I started my career, this stuff didn't even exist, all that. But now it's this one as good as that one. And, and I said, you know, when I was growing up, there was the Rolling Stones and there was the Beatles and there was the Bob Dylan. It wasn't like, which one? It's a revolution of consciousness. It's a garden. It's the rose and the peony and the whatever. You keep your eye on what can you contribute and celebrate the others who can also contribute. You celebrate them and collaborate with them. This idea of your personal brand, some of this, on one hand, I appreciate this new entrepreneurial thing that the millennials have. It's kind of cool, and I think it's part of a correction, ethical correction of, of capitalism that there is a new kind of entrepreneurial spirit coming up. That, that's of itself healthy. But this bottom line, it's got to be me, it's got to be me winning, it's got to be me making the money, is unhealthy. And it keeps you in that grasping mode it doesn't help you win. It's no different with a career than it is with a man or a woman. It doesn't help you get it. It just keeps you always trying to get it. And if you get it, then you lose it because that behavior doesn't allow you to be free within it. Does that make sense? Before we say our final prayer, I just want to say how honored I am that you were here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> it's just great being with you all here. I so appreciate it. And to those of you on, online, thank you so much for being with us. And um, uh, as my mother would say, God willing, we will be here uh, next Wednesday night. And I also want to say happy July. We will, July 4th will happen before I see you again. Right? And uh, for those of you who know me at all, you know I have a few things to say on July 4th. So I will probably be on Facebook Live and uh, share some of my America uh, thoughts about which I, I do am tempted to go on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> uh, one little tidbit I will leave you with that you might find very interesting. Most of the founders practiced astrology because in those days, that was just a gentleman's art. The esoteric arts were part of the gentleman's arts. So the United States was born on July 4th, which is under the sign of cancer. And the, uh, they made it so that there's something in astrology called the Grand Trine. And so they made it that the election is always, what, the first Tuesday? Is the first Tuesday in November, which would always be under the sign of Scorpio, which is another water sign. And then when the Constitution was first written, uh, the inauguration of the president would be on March 4th, which would be Pisces, so it was initially a grand trine. Now, when Franklin Roosevelt was president, he, who I assume was not into astrology, he said, well, we don't really need that much time between the election and the inauguration. So he, he had a change under his administration to January 20th, and it knocked off that grand trine. But isn't it fascinating that they did that? Yes, and also if you look at the great seal on the dollar bill, um, mystical symbols, the great pyramid at Giza and all that. Okay, just a little. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Thank you. <clears throat> And now we take this moment
to rest in the love of God and to send our love to each other. And sending our love to each other, we ask that our love extend to bless the world. We pray for Kelly, Leah, Arit, Scott and Patrick, Christy and the Hefney family, Roxy, Pauline, Nicole and Mignon, <clears throat> Angelique and Amanda, Phyllis Marks, Tracy and Kim Stangle, Ron, Rosalie, and Tom Miller, Brad, and Kai. We call to mind at this time anyone for whom we wish a miracle. We pray for all those who have suffered. We pray for the people in Turkey. We pray for the people in Tel Aviv. We pray for the people in West Virginia. All the people who have recently experienced trials and tribulations in their cities and in their countries. We pray for all people everywhere. We know that you, dear God, and all living things, we know that you, dear God, know who suffers, how and why. For all those who right now feel so lonely and in such pain and who feel that no one cares, we know that you know who they are, dear God, and may the love that we ask that you extend to the world now Give them comfort and give them peace. We place in God's hands our burdens, our questions to be answered. We place in God's hands our burdens and our fears. And we place in God's hands our hopes and our dreams. We place in God's hands our past that only love might remain in our minds we place in God's hands our future. May your spirit come upon us, dear God. Teach us how to forgive. Teach us mercy. Teach us compassion. May we be the people that you would have us be, that we might do as you would have us do. May your voice within us drown out all voice of illusion and fear. Go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and there are angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. Wherever you step, step into the light. And if at any moment you fear, push your hand out in front of you. And pray that your elder brother take your hand and guide your footsteps. This is no idle fantasy. He is here. Asking that the entire world be blessed and that we be used in service of that blessing together. We all say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you.